Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, I'm hoping that all of you are keeping in good health and the ayam e aza are going well. Uh, let us begin by sending our deepest condolences and salutations to Lady Fatima, salamullahi alayha, and the Imam of our time, Imam Mahdi, ajallahu ta'ala, farajahu sharif, on the martyrdom of Aba Abdullah al Hussein and his children and his companions. Adamallahu ujurana wa ujurakum, insha'Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our amals in these holy months of Muharram and Safar. As I had mentioned even last time, that these months of Muharram and Safar come to us with a variety of lessons and examples to learn from. And really, when we think of it, you know, every step, every action, every incident, every uh, event that took place in Karbala comes with a very precious value and a teaching uh, morally, emotionally, uh, physically, spiritually. And the question here is that how can we implement these lessons as actions into our lives? What can we really do to serve our purpose? And this led me to coming up with a very interesting episode today. And the good news is that I am so pleased to be joined with the Muslim counselor, registered psychotherapist, Birak Hussain, who, by the way, was blessed to have visited the holy shrines in Iraq during the first Ashra of this Muharram. And she is back now from her beautiful spiritual journey to share her highlights, her insights, and her experiences of uh, having helped the widows and the orphans in Iraq this uh, in collaboration with Al Kothar Project. Uh, without much further ado, I would like to welcome Sister Barak on board with me on Youth Matters once again. Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sister Barak. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Adam Allah ajurana wa ajurakum. Bistishad. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And our condolences to the Imam of our time and Fatima al Zahra and the whole of Ahl al Bayt. Thank you so much for having me back, sister. I look forward to our episode today. Big time. Same here. It is an absolute honor having you back. And thank you for willing to have a conversation with me on this very uh, purposeful uh, duty and task that you managed to accomplish in uh, Iraq. Uh, really, mashallah, hats off to you for pulling off uh, such a great initiative. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you to do more and more. We really need people like you, mashallah. God bless you. Um, before bless you. we go further uh, deep into our conversation, into our discussion uh, for today, Sister Barak, uh, can you tell everybody what did you feel when you landed in Karbala? And, uh, you know, what was that the first sight uh, when you saw the beautiful golden dome? What, what was the first thing that came into your mind? There is no thoughts, just pure tears. And I cried like a child next to the driver next to me who respectfully let me have that moment. And I think all of us, whenever we see just the tiny bit of the dome when we get into Karbala, whether we're walking, whether we're coming in a big bus with a hamla, whether we're coming individually by cars, we just we're just aching to see that first sight of the dome looking everywhere for yeah. it and for those who cross that bridge and you can see the dome from high i i was looking left and right forgetting where it was because it's been two years and the driver told me yeah abu, abu yeah abu um god bless his name i forgot his name right now abu fatma god bless his name he kept telling me ukhti, ukhti, it's right here and i turned and just <laughs> lost it in tears and i actually recorded every moment of the the trip as much as i could that Instagram could keep because apparently I was doing so many highlights throughout the day that some of the stories disappeared um, And you'll see you'll yeah. see that part if it's still there I put in the highlights where just that first second uh, it, it, It's full of emotions and no words. Uh, that's how I can describe it uh, Truly it is uh, very heart-touching uh, You know the way you said that when we just land there 
you know, we really like we're we're searching for that golden dome of Sayyid al Shahada. Like, you know, the moment we see it, we can, you know, ask for our du'as and prayers. Really, it's just a beautiful moment. Um, you know, as you, as I'm you sure said that, that just, quickly, yeah. just quickly, you know, coming off the plane was another experience in Najaf. So getting off the plane and smelling the air when you come out of the plane. I don't know if you know, there's a yeah. distinct dust smell that you smell in Iraq. That brought me to tears. And as yeah. soon as I stepped down and touched the ground, I bent down and kissed the ground with my hand. Like, you know, I didn't want to look too weird in front of the the, the staff at the <laughs> in the airport, but I did airport. that and it, it stood there and just took it all in. <laughs> so that was the first one. And and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about Amir al-Mu'mineen, but for Karbala, it was, much emotions, no words, and you're just crying like a child, yeah. Now, I'm sure that this must have been a very different experience uh, because of the fact that, you know, we've been living in this lockdown a COVID situation for quite some time now. So keeping in mind the COVID-19 protocols, what was the whole experience like for you this time uh, in, you know, the Najaf uh, International Airport, wherever you landed, basically? what protocol that <laughs> i mean that that's really uh you say in iraq what protocol it's as though covid didn't exist there for people now, official places that's yeah. another story there's thought about what whether it's the airport they kept the protocols most were wearing masks they had uh sanitizer dispensers yeah. everywhere they were checking your pcr yeah. so that was there um my yeah. pharmacist friend god bless her um she she gave, she told me exactly what to do as she traveled last year during COVID to iraq she became yeah. sick herself so she told me the do's and not to do's so i took okay. with me from her pharmacy you know 80 percent alcohol wipes sprays and she told me on the plane spray the whole thing yeah. down and wipe it down the seat where you're sitting wear your n95 okay. on the food, right uh yeah, keep your mask right. on at all times that kind of thing when you go to the washroom spray it down sanitize it some people may think that's a little overboard others will say what yeah. are you even doing why are you even going right. how are you even going and then so i took my precautions i was vaccinated i i did take my precautions and i i did follow her recommendations which also included when you're around lots of people wear the n95 mask when you're not you can wear the regular yeah. mask and then when you go inside yeah. the haram definitely wear that mask and mm -hmm. when you get to your hotel room disinfect it so that's one of the first things i did yeah. i sprayed everything including the carpet and just wiped everything down as high as i could according to my short height so i did take my precautions that way anywhere i went where mm -hmm. even in the in the hotel dining area i would wipe down my area just in case uh, restaurants whenever I went out with family or friends same thing so I did take my precautions just as I would here even let's say I didn't see much around me now when you go out into the Haram area and all of that only a few handful of people are wearing masks those who work oh my God. In system, yeah I mean we're talking thousands of people and I think the count this year for 16 million Zawar came yeah, to Karbala true. This is the number that we had last year during COVID for Arbain. So I can only imagine what yeah. Arbain is going to be like this year. So we know the Zuar, like us who are coming from outside, will probably be doing that, wearing the mask. Yeah. But I also found myself, because I, ended, I my initial uh, intent was not for Ziara. That was a side blessing that came. My initial intent was to work with the widows and orphans, with yeah. Al Ain and as well as Al Kothar. So I kept my precautions as much as I could with the groups and they took the precautions absolutely as well. But I found okay. after a few days, I was, you know, the mask was down. Um, maybe I wasn't exercising as much precaution because you see everybody around you is not and you forget All momentarily. Right. Yeah. And then you see a mask, like, oh yeah, I should put my mask. Oh yeah, sanitize. So my sanitizer was constantly attached to my purse. That was always the case okay. in my previous schools so much more now obviously i had my little uh sprays i think i have one here somewhere uh yeah so i constantly had my sprays in my bag wipes and uh, that and you know it's just that extra layer i don't know if it really did anything because i can tell you yeah. this the place that i went to and i'll give descriptions yeah. of a few other things and the majalis that i entered i should have gotten COVID yeah. the way i interrupted but it was oh through these goodness. precautions number one and number one the blessings of Allah and the protection of the Ahlul Bayt that, that protected me. I can tell you that. So 
it's the both the science as well as the, the faith that I would say protected me because and and uh, I also had some extra boost of of help to to help me with that but I would say that yeah like the some of the places I went to I'll give you a quick example the night of the 10th um Mm -hmm. The Haram closed to me as they were preparing for the next morning for Al Asha. And sure, yeah. while my friend, Dr. Amina from London, she came from, she, so she's the uh, person in charge of Hikayati for Al Ain. And okay. so I was doing training with her team for a couple of days in Najaf. And so she came the day mm -hmm. I was leaving. So we had only a few hours and we didn't get enough of each other. We've known each other for years. Okay. However, mm -hmm. we only got that one opportunity to actually meet face to face. Alhamdulillah, it was a beautiful blessing, but we didn't get enough of each other. And I was heading to Karbala and oh, I had a few man. days there ahead of her. And so we were, we stayed in communication while we were in each city doing our thing. Cause I was done my training by then. It was pure Karbala, Ziyara, not even my family, it was Karbala. Yeah. And she, yeah. she uh, we were just saying, oh, wouldn't it be great if, you know, she came and I said, come, I have room in my hotel just come i'll make sure it's okay for you to be here it wasn't an issue get here just grab a car and come and she did <laughs> she did wow, that's so kind of it's you not, it's not about being kind it's it's about you want to share this with somebody and especially i felt i was kind of like yeah. the indigenous of karbala being a karbala i felt like i want to show off my city to my friend who's never been here Muharram. it was my first time too mm -hmm. so we had quite the adventures yeah. and we'll talk about that later but just briefly so when she came we couldn't get into the haram later on that night to get to for her to get her ziyara. However, my cousins mm -hmm. and so I have an uncle who his relatives have two hotels, and I'm sure those of you who followed the adventures saw how close they were to the haram. One was Bain al Haramain, and one was right across Haram of Al Imam, steps away. So yeah. we took advantage of that, and we wanted to get inside the haram. And my cousins who were at the hotel said, "There's no way you can get in; it's locked up." However, there's a oh, second really floor good. that you could go into which I didn't know, and I think most of us didn't know. You see the windows on the Haram of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? That's a Husseini up yeah, there. Okay. We go up there, on the escalators up there, and the whole night you're hearing drums and you know the mawakib going through Laylat al-Ashir and the, the sounds and the trumpets. We got up there, you could hear the outside. We walked yeah, in. I don't think like, anybody what? really, I mean, usually people don't get a chance to get that sort of a view, the way you're saying. That's very unique. So we, yeah. Here's the thing. We didn't he see the view. We heard it. We got up. There was a huge Husseinia of women. And there was yeah. a majlis right in the middle there. And my friend Mashallah. and I, we didn't think twice. We had our masks on. We're like, let's get in. Let's get in. Because we're hardcore Iraqis. She's Najafi and I'm yeah. Iraqi. We're like, we were right in the center doing the kind of latham that you see Iraqi women do. We were right in the center. We're like, we've missed out a year and a half of this. We have not had majalis like this. We got right in. True. And then so after she was joking with me and said, you know, we probably got COVID. I'm like, doctor, stop it. You don't, don't, don't even know. Inshallah, <laughs> we're protected. Inshallah, you know, people say through the blessings of Ahlul Bayt, there is protection. Sure, absolutely. There's faith, but there's also science. So I think we yes, were very lucky that we, we saw with our masks on the entire time. Others did not. But this was the beautiful part is that we got into places like that where we got to see things that I think the normal za'ir, if you don't have family or connections to show you and tell you, you wouldn't know. So yeah. it was the first time experience and I keep smiling even though it's Muharram because of how beautiful it was and incredible to actually have experienced that, to do Majlis Aza for Abba Abdullah and for give condolences to say the Fatima. I'm remembering now, right near his grave. Allahu Akbar. And then the next day, my friend never got mm -hmm. in to the ziyara. She said, No, I'm going back to Najaf. I have to go to his grave. And we did, we yeah. did. And this woman pushed through and got us right through and touching the dari on the 10th of Muharram. I still can't process that. So maybe it's good we're doing this yeah, program because I saw a lot of things so emotional really like i can actually recall the the letter year of abba abdullah right now literally it's in front of my eyes i can visualize it and really i hope that i could go back again you know you when you go to that place you get that inner peace and satisfaction that is found nowhere really in the world subhanallah, subhanallah. absolutely 
Subhanallah. Now, uh, just uh, I would like to know for my curiosity and of course for everybody who's watching us, how was the population there as in were there a lot of Zawars and was it packed or was it a bit quiet and shallow? Um, you know, were there a lot of uh, the local ones or the visiting ones more? How was it? What was the scene like? So in Muharram, it's very different than Arba'in and other ziyarats. And I learned this okay. before but I, I, because I haven't experienced it. I didn't quite understand until I was there. So culturally and traditionally, it is known that Muharram is for the locals. And when we say locals, yes. we mean the Karabais. Okay. Yes, so they, yeah. do the, they have their mawakib. They have a mawakib from different areas of Karbala that come from Al Hur, from Bab Baghdad, from Al Abbas, like all the different neighborhoods and areas around the Haram and the outer area regions and the Asha'ir, okay. the tribes, the families. So they come and do their mawakib and their azaz every night inside of the Harams and every night when there is a the Laylatul Hur, Laylatul Ansar, Laylatul Abbas, Laylatul Al Qasim, Laylatul Ashr Ali Al Akbar, Laylat Ali Al Azhar. Every night there's uh, traditions that are done that we do here, but are done by the Kabbalah yeah. is there. So Muharram, and I don't take it wrong way when I say it, but it's for the local Karbala is because why are mm -hmm. is for the Zawar that come uh, yeah. from outside of the province as well as internationally. Yeah. Now you do have Zawar that come outside of Karbala during Muharram when around the 10th, okay. especially for Azat Wairij, the Azat when they do the running and they're calling or answering the call of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, is there anybody to help us? And it's as though symbolically they're answering that call through that traditional run. I have to say after wow. being up for more than 24 hours, uh, my friend and I went back to my place and we. she's like, I have to sleep. I'm used to eight hours sleep. And I'm looking at her, what? I'm used to two hours sleep. So we'll get four hours. <laughs> so we slept around four or five hours, but we missed that part and we needed the rest. However, subhanAllah, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Yasameen from Al Kothar, who's from Najaf, she has a, a place of khidma in uh, in Karbala, Bain al Haramein. Okay. She kept calling me, and I was asleep. And she got me a flag. Oh, I forgot to bring it to show you. I'll go grab it in a bit. She got me a flag from Azat Wairij and Tawab, and I said, Subhanallah. Even though I didn't attend to see it, she gave it to me. So it came back, anyways. Now, when we're talking about crowd control, we're talking about uh, numbers of people, like I said, because it's the locals, it's a different feel. It's very, very yeah. Karbala -i Iraqi. You're not going to find a lot of Mawakibs from outside. I did see, however, a few Iranian Mawakibs, Pakistanis, mm -hmm. and there was one night, um, because I arrived the night of Al Abbas, and uh, okay. the brother I was with, uh, Abu Fatma, the driver, he has a badge to get in the Haram. So we put the stuff in the hotel and went straight to the Haram in Najaf by the way we did the same thing and his okay. family met us there and so within an hour off the airport I was in front of Amir al-Mu'mineen and I couldn't process that like it was too Inshallah. quick off the plane within an hour and standing in front of the Imam I didn't know what to say you know when you see a beloved after not seeing them for so long you're at a loss of words and I couldn't step okay. past that little golden step to go to him. I just stood there crying. I stood there. Wallahi al God is my witness. I remembered every person that asked me for du'as, the people who gave me the writing, my daughter, the family, every person. And if I couldn't remember by name, the Nia was there for everybody. And as soon as I finished that, then it was a wave of people that moved away. And it was though the Imam told me to come in. Same thing, subhanAllah, in Karbala with Al Abbas. And it was the same person who took me into the shrine. And of course, it was mass, mass of people, you know, being depending on the time that you arrive there. And I was at high time where people are still there. Again, Al Abbas, I stood, I spoke with him, I beseeched him, I did my salams, and whoever asked. And then, subhanAllah, I walked up and I said, I'm not going to be able to touch him and say salam. And I asked the Khadima there, God blessed her. I said, can I please touch your hand that's touched the dariah? She looked at me, oh my she grabbed my hand, she's like, come here. You know, those, those amazing women are. I know what they grabbed, do. I know. She grabbed my hand and I was terrified here. I'm still like, you know, COVID precaution. She grabbed my hand and just shoved me up to dariah al-Abbas. And she said, grab me, she grabbed my mask. 
She's like, kiss him. Oh my goodness. I'm crying at this point. She grabs my tears and wipes it on the body. We're so dramatic. You've seen Iraqis, how dramatic oh, we are. Yeah. This was I know, I know. This is the kind of drama you want to get into the feels. So she grabbed me, pushed me, pulled my mask down, kissed the body. And I'm like, where's my sanitizer? One second and terrified, but it, it, it incredibly loss of emotion and words and just did what she told me i kissed the dari, wiped the tears and she said those are his feet down there kiss the, his feet kisses and she's telling me and ordering me what to do and i'm just like oh my goodness i did that he will ask he will do your murad he will give you your hajat and i just said please just pray for my daughter and those who couldn't be here i'm a gariba even though i'm originally from here and i haven't been here in two years and she started doing latam like this yeah you know like that beautiful like oh my goodness she goes this is a zaira this is a zaira not all of you who are taking pictures and i stood there and i'm like i took pictures before coming in god forgive me but i took pictures before i went in so this is the type of energy in muharram the locals as you know Beautiful. as and everywhere in iraq along the walk in the most poorest to the most richest of places are rich in their khidma in their service and they're wanting Very to give true. and why i agree the the hospitality is really no. something that you see in iraq out of like just world. beautiful out of, world. out of those worlds yes. yeah yeah definitely so i agree to that this is what you see in Muharram, is the locals are doing their traditions. They are very welcoming of the, the groups, of course, that are there, but it's not packed like Arba'in. Despite that, I found that the high traffic times, so to speak, are right after Salat al-Maghrib till around 10, 11, 12 at night. So I learned the hard way to avoid that time early. When I arrived in Karbala, I avoided that time. Yeah. Uh, I kept uh, I went to my family. They came and picked me up. They're from Hail Abbas, so minutes away. They got to, to the hotel, picked me up, and I would spend the evening with family a little bit. You know, wash my clothes, uh, use a hair dryer, because, you know, certain things you don't have at the hotel. I was hand washing my clothes every day, by the way, in Najaf and uh, in Karbala. My aunt was like, bring your stuff, we'll do it for you. My nails turned black from washing clothes and we couldn't understand why my hands turned black my fingers it was quite bizarre but i i noticed that uh, yeah. the dust the atmosphere does that so tiny things okay. like that was interesting but i spent that time because mm. it was high traffic time and there's just people not yeah. wearing masks it was, and it was hot did i mention how hot it was we're talking no, 45 yeah what was the temperature yes that's how hot it was that you could fry oh an egg in a, top of the car so but oh even goodness. then family was telling me that you know what this is pretty cool compared to when when you know other things uh, other uh, earlier times so alhamdulillah that's how it was uh, those of you who've been in Ziyara in hot times, you know what it's like. Muharram, different feel because it's for the locals and the people who come outside of the city, like Iraqis. And then as yeah. we know in Arba'in, it's for everybody. Uh, the Iraqis, what they do, and I love this custom, it's so respectful, is they try not to go to the Haram area and do uh, Ziyara during Arba'iniyah. They do it before the Zuwar come to open up the space for the Zuwar and they will only go the after Zuwar. the Zuwar. Yeah to do that that is absolutely beautiful. beautiful amazing really that's so kind of them so generous really one well, is yeah it's a now, good opportunity now um uh let's talk about your project uh that you have managed to accomplish in iraq right um and tell us what was your project all about and what was your exact mission and how did you start so I've been the ambassador for Al Kothar Widows, uh, Al Kothar Project for Widows and Orphans for uh, over a year now. Alhamdulillah, an honor to do that. So I've been uh, promoting their campaigns, uh, being actively involved in certain campaigns with the promotion. And long term, the director and I had plans of implementing a mental wellness program that would be a long term project and um, a continuous self sufficient, so to speak, like uh, that would continue as a, a wellness program for the widows as well as for the orphans the idea there is to have mental health supports for them not just financial support not just backpack supports not just okay. you know air conditioning or medical supplies no but to, to complete what helping somebody is all about is a holistic aspect not just physical but the mental and the spiritual so 
this was when they when they recruited me to do this this was part of our plan more than a year ago but because of covid we worked actively online yeah. virtually doing the campaigns so this was a project that was a long time running and i've done this project before with other groups but it never continued um and so okay. i told them i will only take it on if you plan on making this a permanent thing in terms of this program yeah. alhamdulillah it did and so subhanallah during the last month uh, two months you know here the restrictions started opening up a little bit talk around if people got vaccinated they can travel without the quarantine and i just can't deal with quarantine with uh, having being away from my daughter and work and all of that and so it all just jumbled up at the same time that and it happened beautifully i was able to take that time off work the project was yes a go ahead in iraq even though it would be muharram and the yeah. flights boom uh you know the the piece everything just fell into place when i put out the knee ya Abu abdullah since i can travel i want to service i want to do service this year not just in my city but i want to do service and not just virtually and whether it's in london yeah. whether it's in florida and i put the i gave the because all of my contacts were saying are you able to come like no but when i was able to i let them know so i put the nia out there so look how strong our intentions work in terms of how we propagate our vision into action okay i put that intention out i want to serve you how can i serve you this year and subhanallah within a week he called me to him subhanallah you got you were the chosen that. one no 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 let's not let's not say things like that but subhanallah it's again it's about your intentions you know put that intention out there and this all fell into place i asked permission from my daughter first and foremost would you be okay if i go to iraq because that means i would take a little bit of time away from her right and i told her would you be okay if i go to iraq to help these women and children she said of course mama i will miss you but i know you're going to be helping people and i want you to do that god bless her soul <laughs> So, oh, alhamdulillah, this is, how, sweet and kind this is how it happened. It was Allah, subhanAllah. This is how it happened. Now, the aim of this project, our phase one part, because Al-Kothar had done other various mental health initiatives before with other professionals. This was a different project in the sense that we were going to work directly with training the local staff in terms of how to interact, how to have proper listening skills, non-judgmental skills, and support and referring to connect, you know, how they interact with the, the widows. And also looking at how we can offer the widows a group, a space for them. So this is what the mental yeah. wellness group was about and the wellness program in general was about that. So Alhamdulillah, as this was happening, I've also been working with the Lain which is also a very well-known uh, organization, the number one organization in the world, we have to say, for widows and orphans. That is endorsed by Sayyidina and it is well-known internationally. And so I've been working with Dr. Amina over the last few years here okay. and there, sharing resources, sharing presentations that I give uh, and present, and not myself, a variety of different professionals around the world were, were doing that. And so this was a work in progress the last three years. And when she went back in the spring and she did something similar to, to when I did a few years ago, when she reached out to me and saw me going to Iraq doing that, she said, I want you to go to Al Ain headquarters in Baghdad and look at our center, talk to the staff, connect. And it was an out of world experience, I have to say, to see, mashallah, how the donations and the support of the Marja'iya can really push forward amazing initiatives that can help the people, especially the vulnerable people of Iraq. I was so impressed by them. And after that, that's when we started working on these workshops and there's amazing professionals around the world. I have to give a shout out to Dr. Buthaina uh, in the US who was my co-partner in this. And we, we put together finally, after three years, these workshops that were put together and we fine sifted through them, so to speak, to customize them for the training that we did with Al Ain. So they had this amazing 30 day training for their local Hikayati staff in Najaf and in Baghdad and other places. And 30 days. And so Dr. Bussein and I did days. the first two days. Yeah, it's so we long time. It around the same time. And so Dr. Amina is like, oh, Barak, what do you think? After I told her, hey, what's up? I, you know, I want to get more involved this time around. And she said, hey, you know, how would you feel? I'm like, oh my goodness, are you serious? I'm actually going to Iraq. And so it just, subhanAllah, fell <laughs> around the same time to do that. And so I divided my time with Alain, where we did three-day training at the amazing Coca Belafkia, 
the world of the intelligent or universe of the intelligence is gorgeous education center in Najaf. Again, if you want to see it, go to okay. my highlights and off there. Incredible. It's a place of imagination for children and books and toys and the, the way the place is in, uh, decor not decorated, architecturally designed by Mohandas uh, Namir, who was an incredible human being, him and his wife from Fatima, they, they developed and implemented this concept in Najaf and it's a place of wonder for children. So we did our three day training with Al Ain after I met Al Kotha okay. on the first day I was there. Um, I'm jumping all over the place. So let me go in order. I, I met with Al Kotha staff on my first day after the night when I arrived for Ziyara and incredible people. And they have this cute little place that needs proper electricity because it's so hot. It's so hot. And afterwards, we went and visited a few families. We went to see the land where, inshallah, the future building of Al Kothar will be built. And it's right near Bahar al Najaf. It was a gorgeous place. Um, the, unbelievable that we have such beauty in Iraq, but it's not taken care of properly to take full advantage for the locals as industry and employment and just beautiful places behind the Haram and Wadi Salam for. Uh, people to to go and and enjoy the, the the beautiful nature anyhow so we did that the first day and then three days I was with the the, the amazing people of Al Ain and then we did our training which we did get this this is how amazing this was okay. we got to do Kotha training right across from Al Haram of Amir Al Mu'minin Ali Salam in Dar Al Alam wow, which is yeah, the Khu'i the Institute. So it's a conference center and a house al Niya for international and local students to come and study. And so we were very blessed because Al Kothar is with Al Khu'i. We had access to that, but it was a nightmare to get in in the morning because of the checkpoints. And I don't know if you saw, we started uh, so much later. I, I, I captured all of the craziness of, uh, of the realities of Iraq in terms of the small yes, things that you want to do but all the roadblocks. So I'm watching our time, so I'm gonna quickly speed up here. So this was yeah. the training that we did on the next three days after that. I said, there's no way we can do this training in the Kothar Center, which doesn't have proper running electricity because it's based on the local electricity. We need a space that is calm, full running air conditioning for our ladies to feel what I'm gonna say. If I'm telling them, oh, let's do some breathing, relaxation techniques and it's 50 degrees like a tanur it's not going to work so we were very lucky to get the khatun hall and it's actually you know a conference center slash wedding hall that they gave to us for an amazing price because of the work that we were doing with widows and it was such a beautiful white beautiful space with beautiful flowers that when you walk in and the cool air is there you immediately feel sukun and serenity so our project i would say more than met our expectations, alhamdulillah, with the generosity of all of those who donated to make these programs work. Because of course it costs money to get yes. these spaces, to provide exactly. the support for our ladies. And I have to say quickly, and please do look at the YouTube as well as the Instagram videos for the day-to-day -day that we did with Al Kothar as I documented everything there, uh, the drama, the uh, can't get it to places, the actual, uh, training that we did and of course the wellness groups with the ladies how amazing they were they were warm and welcoming to see i was actually following you up and i was very inspired i was keeping a track on your instagram stories and they were amazing and in fact we have one of your videos here that we can share uh you know uh, it's about the same mental wellness that you're talking about the, the widows uh, in this beautiful hall so uh, yes. we'll be showing that on screen as well in this uh, on the video. Assalamu alaikum. Here we have our third and final day of our wellness groups with the wonderful ladies that we've connected deeply with over the last three days. Here we have Sister Ala from Al Kothar who is doing an introduction and review with the ladies from what we have learned over the last two days and how they benefited from it and what they enjoyed and what they got the most out of it. And continuing on that day, we got more in depth as the ladies gave specific examples of challenges they faced on how people mistreat them, judge them, and throw really harsh words at them and how that makes them feel bad. And so what we were able to do is take from these specific examples and role play, which brought out a lot of laughs and giggles and joy from the ladies where they got a chance to actually role play from one side of the room to the other in saying, what kind of hurtful words that were set upon them or examples 
and they got the opportunity to reply back by reframing with humor, reframing with strength. This day also we got the opportunity to understand the position of the orphan and the widows in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by connecting it to the holy days of Muharram and Lady Zainab sallallahu alayha and how through her we garner our strength in order to be able to play our role in our society. The ladies then got the opportunity to do some self-care with going back and doing some art and coloring which brought back memories of them from their childhood and understanding again that although life throws very difficult situations at you, you still have the opportunity to take care of yourself in order to be able to take care of your children and understanding that their role as a widow in this society has given them the opportunity to get thawab and ajr by giving people the opportunity to get thawab and ajr through them, by donating to them, by supporting them and helping them in such programs that we have accomplished over the last few days. Again, it was a wonderful three days of in-depth discussions that, inshallah, in the future we can do more and more with only your support, of course. Where we can provide amazing spaces for these ladies to feel relaxation, to learn strategies, to learn how to reframe the hurtful words and judgments that is put upon them in the society that they live in. And give them the opportunity to just connect at the human level and do things that they haven't been able to do at all, such as the coloring as you see here, and how much they truly, truly enjoy that. So, uh, Barak, now, um, you know, I, I want to know from you, when I was watching one of your Instagram stories, uh, you know, I saw you, you were literally going home to home and, you know, sitting uh, next to these people and having a really heart to heart conversation with them, you know, mashallah. Um, may Allah bless you really for your tireless efforts. You know, the conditions of their houses were, were really, it was very heartbreaking seeing because, you know, um, I saw in your stories, they were living in a clustered, cramped up one room you know, not even this, a standard sized room, very tiny, yeah. uh, with a tiny yeah. kitchen uh, shoved on the corner and, you know, broken ceilings with cracks on it. And I don't know how these people even like uh, get their meals in a day, for example, they're probably feeding mm -hmm. on one or two meals in a day. So, you know, what sort of planning was needed here? How, how did you go about it? So the the organization wanted me to see specific families that were in, in dire need and okay. their circumstances were pretty extreme and you saw one of them, Sister Shema, where she, her husband died from illness and she still lives with her in-laws and they're toxic, unhealthy people um, and so yeah. she wanted her own space to live and so, so when I was going into their homes I was being very uh, Del delicate and very careful, cautious. We wouldn't show people because it's, it's about dignity, right? So we would show um, right. them speaking and telling us what was going on. And so we wanted donors and sponsors and other families outside to see what I was seeing there so they could specifically help these specific families. And so even when we right. were doing the day wellness group, a lot of the ladies came and were talking to me about their challenges and how they wanted support like some women were saying i don't want a house i just want somebody to sponsor my son's education for a year he's a brilliant student he okay. needs extra support we want to be independent when he can become a doctor some people said you know i have okay. anxiety i and one woman in the group disclosed her anxiety and how she keeps everything in right and and then she'll have these panic attacks so this woman would need no to problem. see a doctor and medication yeah. for that for example you know and, and and things like that so they would come asking for certain things god bless them and i know our donors are so generous and i know mashallah inshallah in the next few days we'll have um, a video come out talking about the program but also our next campaign for arba'in inshallah and i'll give updates and highlights about that but i have to say i was so amazed by the generosity of the donors who would specifically message me and say this is for this person because i put names of people anybody who would like to help out yeah. this family he's this and also because of it was leading up to arba'in and we're promoting green and uh being green and also looking at how uh to thank our donors for those who were donating and who wanted um inshallah i know you haven't gotten it yet so i'm sorry about that but inshallah, soon I'll be sending these boxes out. Let me see here, bring it up close to the camera. The spiritually yes. green containers. You see spiritually that? Spiritually green. 
reusable food containers. What a smart move. Wow. So That's amazing. This was something, I'll give you a quick lowdown about this. So these are the containers that come with this bag here. So what's the idea behind this? Well, just quickly, because I know the time, uh, before the pandemic, I saw these boxes in the store. And I'm like, oh, this is great. You know, I'm going to buy this and use it when I go to Arbaim next, because I'm really big on green and I have been for the last few years. And especially when you go to yeah. Ziara, you see the trash and everything outside. It's, it's just too much, right? You've seen it. I don't need to get into right. details. So when I bought this, I'm like, oh, if anybody wants, let me know. And then people started sending me money. Buy throw up for me and give it out to people so i ended up buying wow. tons of them and then the pandemic hit and they just stopped and they just sat here so now they came to good use in the sense that they've collected dust over the last two years only to be subhanallah for alkota campaign what we're gonna do wow. and what i've done already is i've taken a few with me to ziyara they've touched the holy places and those who have donated and wanted have sent me their address and names. You will be getting them soon, inshallah. Don't worry. And this is as a thank you for those who donated. And the idea is to promote these, to take them to your majalis, but also on the walk. So the idea is to have this. This then attaches. You can hook it up, tie it to your backpack. You can rinse your food when you go yeah. to a mokib. Taking the paper plate, the, the styrofoam plates, you'd stick this out. You get the food yes. in it. You eat it, rinse it. Put it in this bag and walk along. I know people are like, oh, I don't feel like washing. I don't know. Have you seen the trash? This is an Islamic responsibility, an ethical responsibility that we have to keep the places of the holy places clean, our whole earth. Imagine Abu Abdullah and Ahl al Bayt were deprived of water. And here we are just throwing away uh, bottled water and, and plastic. No, that doesn't work. You take reusable containers like this and bottles. We go to different Moaka, we have to get the trend going. Now, quickly also, is what's going to happen now, inshallah, for the next part of our campaign, along with the mental wellness, because I'm going for round two, inshallah, we're going to be doing the, tra not the training, we're going to be doing wellness groups, because our ladies took so much to the wellness program, they benefited emotionally, spiritually, and mentally, leaving so empowered, and they loved it so much, they said they were willing, during our buying, as busy as it is, to come to the group. So we're doing yes, that. We we're going to give these out. And Al Kothar finally got a mokib this year. Number 70, poll number 70. We will be having a mokib for a few days. We're giving out water. We'll be giving out snacks and treats. Not full meals yet, inshallah, next year. However, one day I will be there with these boxes. Okay? With these boxes, I will be there and the bags where you can come and get the box there. We're also going to be promoting recycling reusing and we're going to be having having inshallah big tanks of water bring your bottled water and you will be having containers made from cardboard <laughs> that you can put in the containers the green box the black box and the blue box it's going to take a while but i am confident that over the next few years this will pick up inshallah every mokib can do this and every za'ir will be a spiritually green aware conscious za'ir because it is ridiculous the amount of garbage that is left there during Ziyarah, I saw it during Muharram, I've seen it every Arba'in, you have all seen it as well. And inshallah, you know, once we start this trend, everybody who's watching right now and everybody who's going to Ziyarah, make the effort to take your own with you and then I'll keep you a box yeah, there as well. Let me idea. It's, it's not it's hard at all. It's a very excellent idea. Like, I really like the, the way, you know, you've come up with this idea, a very smart concept. And I hope that many people can really uh, implement this uh, amazing. Now let's Allah. talk about, uh, you know, the, I, I had seen there were these beautiful artworks uh, that were representing Lady Zainab, salam Allahi alayha, and I think uh, yes. you had put them on a bid, if I'm not wrong. Uh, that's what I saw on yes. your story. Um, yes, that's so exactly the one that I'm talking about. The beautiful. These, these still have the dust of Karbala on them. Oh, I've not my cleaned God. them. Final, beautiful. Yes. Mashallah. So let me tell you quickly about this. So last year, I yes. thought what we did is we teamed up with uh, several groups the artist of this design brother muhammad hamza from london uh, from england rather not london uh bronze digitals who put it together and um i modern art from the states um so this okay. the the, mo the company actually teams up with different people to promote a, a charity and then the donations go towards the artist and the charity so i told her okay so i work with al kothar how about this how about we use these designs 
for people to buy these pieces of artwork representing, say, the Zainab and the the, the Battle of Karbala yeah. rising and all of these amazing, empowering beauty about, say, the Zainab, right? So why yeah. don't we sell these? Okay, and then the money goes towards obviously the artist who took who made these, but to Al yeah. So we did this campaign last Muharram through Al Kothar. And this okay. year what I did is I took this set with me. I had an extra set from the leftovers. I took it as you can see yeah. how it touched the ground of the holy places, right between Bab al Qibla and also Sayyida Zainab's maqam. This was the night of Shami Gariban, what you see where it was in the Haram, Amazing. and you see right behind the speaker, this is right across, this is a, the door of Fatima to Zahra, Sayyidah Zainab, salam Allah alayha. It was very meaningful and spiritual where we took these pictures, where it touched. And so what I'm doing is we're auctioning these off to the highest bidder, inshallah, over the next week okay. or two, to the highest bidder. And the money will go straight towards our mental wellness program, inshallah. So these are not Inshallah. books. Somebody said, oh, I want to buy this book. It's not a book. It's an artwork. It still has the cover on it, the edge. This set <laughs> here, the Holy Land, in Najaf, in front of Bab al-Zahra, in Sahan al-Zahra, uh, salam Allah alayha, in the Haram, and also in Karbala, Shami Gariban, right across from Tal Zainabiya and Ras al-Sharif, where the Imam was martyred. So the these have a lot of so this again we're auctioning this off to the highest bidder i have to figure out how to do that in the next week or two before heading out but inshallah the highest bidder will receive this in the mail with the blessings and the donations will go inshallah to our widows and orphans okay now sister barak uh as you know that we're running out of time but i have to ask Zizou. you this very important question which <laughs> which i think is the um a very important question um, I was uh, going through your Instagram again, and I think um, you sort of came across a, a verbal sexual harassment incident while you were in the holy shrine, Al Muqaddas of Karbala. Um, what was that all about? Uh, was it, first of all, in Karbala? If I'm not wrong, you can correct me. Uh, was it in Karbala? Was it in Najaf? Um, what was it all about, and what message would you like to give us? Long story short, uh, it was Shami Gariban in Karbala. I was in those spaces uh, that you saw in the pictures before. We just had a huge majlis bain al Haramain where the men were talking about Ghirat al Abbas, how al Abbas get up, protect your sister, you know, all this amazing type of uh, rhetoric. And as I was walking between Tala Zainabi and I kept going back and forth and showing the candles, and I was very happy to do these lives as much as I could because I know what it feels like not to be there and wanting to be there. And I made a covenant with Allah, if you let me go again, every time I go, I will take the zuwar with me every step of the way where I go as though they are there with me. So that was my intent. And as we had this live on that night, a male viewer made a comment about how I look, which I found incredibly inappropriate. And although they must have thought that they were complimenting me, you can't do that. And so in that moment, I couldn't believe as I was talking about raising money for widows and orphans, as I was talking about what this night was all about, as I was talking about Sayyida Zainab, this Al Abbas, this and so on and so forth, and we just had this Majlis Bain Al Haramain, it just hit me that so many males, and I don't say men because there's a difference between being a man and being male, so many males think that it's okay for them to compliment a woman or give her a compliment about the way she looks and that a woman is supposed to say thank you and not think twice about it, including our Muslim men, especially our Muslim men. And so this just made me think, how dare you? Who do you think you are that you could talk about the way I look, especially given where we are in the sacredness of the Haram? The sacredness of Shami Gariban, the sacredness of Sayyida Zainab. How dare you speak about my looks? How has this got anything to do with the content that I'm talking about, the message that we were talking about? And so this is a form of verbal sexual harassment that a lot of women experience. So as soon as I started talking about them, calling out that person and publicly shaming him and telling him, how dare you speak to me this way? A lot of people started coming on and started commenting, both men and women. 
and saying that this is a common thing that happens and we don't talk about this where men could think that they could speak about a woman's looks and we are supposed to say thank you when we are talking about a cause a mission that has nothing to do with our yeah. appearance Whether you are an True. attractive or unattractive person is besides the point here it is how dare you bring in anything about somebody's appearance to begin with when we are talking about something spiritual religious psychological of importance that has nothing to do with our appearances and so this message came very clearly i hope across and i had to hold myself and speak appropriately because we are more inclined to get into public araqi <laughs> trashing uh, somebody and thrashing rather uh, when you get riled up and upset about something but alhamdulillah I was reminded by a viewer who had just happened to walk by, an Iraqi viewer, Brother Ahmed from Basra, from Al Hajj al Shabi, God bless him, who's, who had the live on and said, What's going on? And I said, ABC. He says, Simple, block him, don't lower yourself to his level, and move on. And I said, You know, it's simply said, put that way. And I agree with that. Normally, that's what I would do. However, if we don't call it out, if we don't stand up, if we don't speak up, if we don't put that person on the spot and tell them, no, you cannot speak to me this way. No, you cannot do that. Then how are we setting the standard and stopping and bringing awareness? Because we know what kind of physical sexual harassment happens in the haram. After I posted this, and I wasn't going to, a lot of women reached out, including men, were very hurt and disappointed that this happened but women reached out telling me how they were physically groped during ziyara and we know this happens mm -hmm. it's unfortunate but a lot of men will grab women in, in private places inside of the haram when it was mixed before not anymore but also around the haram because there's such a mass of people you know around yeah. that it's easy to get away with this kind of sexual harassment behavior it's not okay yeah, and we're standing here to say no you cannot comment on our looks and you cannot touch us. We're in the sacredness of the haram. My body is my body. You are not allowed to touch it. Now, even as we're talking about this, where is halal and haram here in this? Like, how are these men even calling themselves men if they're doing this kind of behavior? But then this is deviant behavior. This is not the norm. We're not saying this happens everywhere all the time, but it, it is common and it does happen. Now, locally, and I experienced this, by the way, myself years ago when the haram used to be mixed inside where men and women were in the same area before they split up now, is that I was also groped, unfortunately. My sister also. And it happens. And as I, I'm like, oh, you know, like, what's going on? Oh what was this? You don't know. I know. I'm sorry. We have to speak about this. My aunt said, shh, yeah. be quiet. Keep walking. If you say or do or, or anything or yell, then they're going to say you asked for it and it's your fault. That's what they think there. I was shocked that my sister, on the other hand, what does she do? She was inside Al Abbas, Fidwal Isma, alayhi salam. She was right in front of his darih, uh, and she got groped from behind. You know what she did? And oh I think every goodness. person should do this. She turned around and smashed her fist in the guy's back and called him a dog. How dare you touch me? My cousin, who's a local, covered her face in abaya and walked out. But this is how you treat people who touch you. You smash them in the back. You, you call it out. And I know, I know, I know. It's not easy for everybody to do that. But if we don't speak out, because there's a sense of shame, like you did something wrong. There's something wrong with your body. Yeah. You ask for it. No, you did not, my sister. It is not your fault. Whether they say anything to you about the way you look, whether they touch you inappropriately, you did not ask for it. You were in full coverage hijab. This is deviancy from their side. This is a deficiency from their side. There is something wrong with them, not you. I don't want any sister to feel that she did anything wrong, no matter how you were dressed, whether you're in full abaya or not. Nobody has the right to look at you and say anything inappropriate about the way you look or touch you. Absolutely not. This is a red line and women, we need to stick together and not tell the other women, be quiet. No, we need to speak out. And mashallah, I have to tell you this. One man came up to me and kept trying to get my attention as I was walking Bain al Haramain. I walked in with the Iranian group into Al Abbas and came out just like we do in Arba'in. And they opened the door, they were telling people, come, come, come. And I'm like, I'm going in, by the way. Yeah. I was doing a lot, but then it got cut off and it all disappeared. But that's okay. When I went in and out and, and Bain al Haramain and I was able to report again, a brother came up to me and he kept trying to get my attention. I didn't recognize him, but it was somebody that I actually knew, but I didn't recognize them. Immediately when the guards of the of the Haramain were there, 
and they saw that this man was talking to me and I didn't know him. I'm like, what are you doing? They immediately told him to back off. So there are people there who protect women around. I'm okay. telling you. But if we don't say anything, if we don't show our distress, then how are they going to know? So I can attest to the mm -hmm. fact that there is protection there. There is a culture of protecting women. There are men there, real men like Al Abbas, who do not approve of this and will stand up. This was just somebody trying to talk to me and they did that. I, I apologize to the brother later when I realized who it was, but I didn't know at the time. And so my sisters, again, you have done nothing wrong. You are allowed to speak up. And as sisters, we all have to, and brothers too, I can't tell you how many brothers reached out and said how upset they were about the situation and how proud they were that we're finally speaking out and saying something about it. And like I said, this is not something that happens all of the time. It does happen yeah. commonly, you know, it does happen and we have to do something about yeah. it. Thank you so much, Sister Barak, for sharing a very uh, important, uh, valid viewpoint. Um, you know, it's very controversial to talk about such things on public, and I salute you, really. You have really got the guts, and um, I would say the same thing to all the sisters out there, that, you know, don't hush yourselves, don't stay quiet, don't stay silent. If you see something that is inappropriate, you should always speak out for it. So uh, thank you so much for uh, joining me on today's episode. Um, it was really beautiful. I enjoyed talking to you. Um, the conversation really took me to Karbala, and I know that all the viewers uh, jo uh, who are watching us enjoyed the, today's program. Uh, as uh, Barak was talking to us, she literally took all of us uh, spiritually to the, uh, Karbala and Najaf and uh, Iraq, and I hope that all of you enjoyed today's session. Um, thank you uh, for joining me today, and uh, I hope that you enjoyed the program. Catch me next week again uh, from 3 to 4 p.m. only on Hidayat TV. This is your host, Sakina Mushtaq Habib. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum.